hello hello yeah participants are joining yeah uh, begin the session in uh, two minutes probably right, right. i'll till then i'll load my presentation yeah sure sir Is it visible? It's visible, sir. Okay. And I am audible clearly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's one yes. o'clock, so I think, sir, uh, we can start, right? Yes. How many are there? Uh, presently, 33 people have joined. Fine. And 34th came. So oh. uh, they will Fine. join within 5 or 10 minutes. Okay. So uh, we can start the session on time. That's what I think. Fine. I think we can start. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, good afternoon, all the participants, and welcome back to the today's session, second session. Uh, I hope you had your lunch by this time. So uh, let me introduce you to our today's speaker. Uh, Dr. K. S. Gumaste is presently working as an associate professor in the Department of Civil Engineering. Valchand College of Engineering, Sangli. He has done his PhD in civil engineering from IIC Bangalore. He has worked as a project engineer for six years and then continued to work in the teaching field for past 28 years. He has taught various courses related to project management, energy and building, concrete technology and earthquake engineering. He has worked on various sponsored projects and also received grants from AICT. Dr. Gumaste has published 45 papers in international and national journals and conferences. He has organized several courses, seminars, and also worked as a resource person in various workshops. His today's topic of presentation is earthquake resistant masonry structures. So uh, I welcome you, sir. And, yeah, thank, uh, uh, thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Soni. Uh, I hope I minute, can take sir. over the session. I just just one, one last minute, sir. Yeah. I request all the participants to keep your audio and video off and don't present your screen. And uh, we are going to keep the question answer session, sufficient time for question answer session at the end. So uh, if you have any doubts or any questions, you please type it in the chat window and we'll definitely take it today. OK, so that's what from my side. Over to you, sir. OK, uh, thank you, Dr. Soni, for uh, that uh, brief uh, introduction. 
and uh, a very good afternoon to all the participants uh, of this uh, FDP on seismic analysis of multi-story the RC buildings using uh, various softwares. In fact, uh, my today's uh, topic is somewhat, uh, I would say, out of context to the area proposed uh, in this FDP. Uh, however, uh, I proposed to Dr. Patil that uh, I would be interested to talk about masonry because uh, structural masonry is uh, something which is uh, very close to my heart. I have been working uh, since past 20, 25 years on uh, masonry units, various roofing technologies, alternate uh, appropriate technologies for buildings. And masonry has been uh, one of the interesting uh, areas which I have been exploring uh, during my post-graduation, my research, as well as uh, some of the some of my students who take up uh, works on these. Uh, the objective of uh, I taking this area is uh, masonry today uh, is somewhat has become an unromantic kind of an uh, topic amongst uh, civil engineers or structural engineers in specific. I see rarely uh, anybody working on masonry, very few people. Uh, in fact, even uh, very few IITs like IIT Kanpur, IIC Bangalore, IIT Madras, uh, are, uh, there are a couple of guys who are working uh, extensively on masonry. But however, uh, a lot more uh, work needs to be done in this area. Uh, masonry has become a, 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 te a technique which is uh, uh, a next door kind of a technology where people don't think that uh, masonry is something to be designed. Uh, it is something, a wall, uh, which is not a structural element. Rarely masonry is considered as a structural element these days. Although a uh, lot of people who are into dynamic uh, studies uh, in the area of dynamics uh, do generally in flame, in frame, in field frame analysis. I feel uh, it is uh, time that um, most of our students, uh, even structural engineers need to uh, look at some of the recent uh, trends that have occurred in the past couple of decades. What are we into masonry, people who have been working what is that has come out of these studies is something that I'm going to highlight today. So I will not basically enter into any of the uh, modeling techniques or uh, uh, your equations of motions uh, uh, as the FDP uh, suggests, like uh, it is basically a seismic analysis. But what I would be probably today uh, highlighting my major objectives uh, of today's uh, uh, talk are basically to impress that masonry is also a structural component which most of us uh, have uh, left masonry behind. The second uh, objective is to get a feel of uh, static properties of big masonry uh, which is going to be my first part of the lecture. Uh, basically because uh, when it comes to brick or brick masonry or a masonry unit, what we talk about maximum is the compressive strength and its water absorption. Apart from that, we never have probably explored anything at the undergraduate uh, level beyond uh, these two characteristics of the material. Uh, and we have not gone beyond what kind of masonry design uh, is required. How do we... Uh, I come across the decide the thickness of the wall. Uh, it is that uh, multi storied buildings need uh, uh, lesser wall thicknesses because they are non load bearing, placing the brick masonry into even concrete walls today in um, high storied uh, uh, buildings. Uh, but the thickness has become uh, lesser and lesser. We are trying to increase the floor area, uh, etc., in terms of external walls. We have been compromising to a large extent as, uh, as far as uh, uh, the design of masonry is concerned, where a majority of the uh, are non-framed also, 
uh, other buildings, I think uh, we have forgotten the, uh, the concept that we still can go for load bearing structures with appropriate kind of uh, ground conditions, uh, with an appropriate uh, uh, foundation. We still can go for brick masonry uh, as a load bearing structure for even three to four stories, uh, which we have seen in the past, like most of the uh, buildings uh, uh, which were constructed uh, about four to five decades back. We can see that they are still standing, they are uh, uh, with durability and with stability, these buildings have been performing. However, uh, the kind of quality of the materials that we use becomes uh, nonetheless important. Uh, and thereby, before I enter into some of the uh, areas of uh, how these buildings, masonry buildings behave in earthquake, or what kind of hybrid uh, construction can be adopted, uh, we need to get a feel of uh, some of the static properties of brick masonry, which I will concentrate only with an objective that uh, what kind of studies are required at the UG and PG levels in terms of brick masonry. Uh, we have uh, tried to uh, sideline experiments uh, being done on various uh, uh, components uh, of masonry and thereby uh, I wanted to highlight this area of the static characteristics of brick masonry to a certain extent. And uh, the last objective is uh, not to discuss about how the buildings uh, are to be designed, but today to create an awareness amongst uh, the teachers and PG candidates, the importance of simple experimental studies to assess the performance of masonry buildings under dynamic loads. And also, uh, what are the, apart from the kinds of codes that are available for uh, our uh, uh, country, like uh, we have guidelines for earthquake resistant non-engineered construction. We have uh, basically IS 1893. In terms of masonry, we have uh, IS uh, 13827, uh, the improvements uh, that are required in earthquake resistant uh, urban buildings, low strength masonry buildings, 13828 speaks about uh, IS 13828 speak. But I'm not basically going to uh, concentrate on the Indian codes today. But as far as hybrid constructions are concerned, neither they are uh, uh, engineered constructions, nor we can say that they are completely non-engineered constructions because a lot of buildings are being constructed in the European countries. Uh, and thereby, I would like to highlight today a little bit about uh, the various other kinds of uh, European codes as to how they adopt uh, uh, the design of the masonry buildings to a certain extent in terms of hybrid construction is what probably I would like to uh, talk about. And thereby, uh, you may feel, majority of the participants may feel that it would be a kind of deviation from the kind of RC buildings. Uh, but then it would be uh, an added knowledge uh, for, to, uh, to structural engineers who are also into the design of RC buildings that this information needs to be triggered is what I thought today. Before uh, entering into the subject matter, I generally start with a few questions, try to introspect uh, as to how much we can answer this as undergraduate or postgraduate students. Uh, one of the, some of the questions are, as you see on the slide, what is the range of compressive strengths of bricks in India? Are we aware about uh, the codal provisions? Um, uh, about uh, what this material, which has been reigning over past uh, 50 years, uh, 60 years, uh, being used as one of the major materials for masonry construction, uh, burnt clay bricks. When I say bricks, it is burnt clay bricks. Although a lot of other alternatives have come into the market today, like we have stabilized mud blocks, we have fly ash bricks, we have calcium silicate bricks, we have uh, the aerated concrete blocks today which have come into the market. So uh, apart from that, but still bricks have been uh, ringing uh, still uh, strongly into the construction industry. We still produce, uh, we are the second largest country in producing bricks. Uh, we produce about 400 billion bricks every uh, year in the construction area. And uh, although a high energy material because it, it is to be burned, but then still it is one of the strongest uh, materials being used. 
So what are the range of compressive strengths that we, we, we have in India is something the, uh, uh, and there is a lack of information on this, although portal provision just says uh, that uh, 35 kgs per centimeter square or 3.5 megapascal is something which is a kind of uh, uh, a line to be drawn in order for acceptability or non-acceptability. But then when it comes to load bearing construction, the strength of the brick becomes very important. What properties uh, are important for assessment of masonry quality when it comes to uh, the design of columns, beams, and slabs? We are very much uh, well aware uh, about the areas at the undergraduate level, although uh, I do not know whether as a structure we are still competent enough to design, but then at least uh, we know how to design a beam uh, with the different boundary conditions or a column with uh, different end conditions. Uh, but then, what about masonry is something which uh, becomes questionable. What is an appropriate kind of a, a, a thickness of the masonry uh, which is at the center of the building in case of a load bearing structure or how are external walls to be uh, designed is something which uh, still remains a question uh, even in the uh, undergrad uh, undergraduate uh, candidates. Are the bricks and mortars used in India same as that of the Western countries? Uh, is something there is a lack of information on this uh, in majority of our textbooks. Have we learned masonry design during our graduation? Uh, hopefully, majority of the universities do not consider this as a subject matter or a course, uh, and uh, thereby uh, probably there could be a lack of information in majority of the institutes. And uh, if not, if we have not learned masonry designer, as a designer or an engineer, how do we assess the adequate requirements of strength of raw materials and the adequacy of the masonry strength? What guidelines or codal recommendations are adopted for assessing the masonry structures to perform satisfactorily during moderate earthquakes? These are some of the questions which we need to introspect as far as uh, uh, real uh, structural engineers uh, today are concerned and thereby with these kind of questions uh, I would like to start my uh, today's uh, subject uh, on uh, earthquake resistant uh, masonry structures. Let me uh, get into the basics of uh, the brick masonry. Uh, factors which basically affect the compressive strength of masonry itself. Uh, there are three major kind of uh, components which affect, uh, which are important factors for affecting the compressive strength of the masonry. One is the brick itself, the major, major building unit that we use, uh, the characteristics of the brick, the characteristics of the mortar, uh, basically because uh, all these brick units are bounded or they are bound by basically a matrix and uh, it could be cement mortar, it could be a lime mortar, it could be a combination mortar and uh, majority of the times we have seen that uh, brick with one is to six cement mortar is what we generally recommend in the Indian conditions but however whether it is appropriate or not is something which we are also going to discuss uh, in future. So it is the characteristics of the brick, the characteristics of the mortar and the masonry itself where uh, when we come to some of the characteristics, important characteristics to be discussed, uh, as far as brick is concerned, uh, rather than compressive strength, I would uh, prioritize elastic modulus of the material to be more important than the compressive strength. And then the compressive strength, the type and size of the bricks that we utilize uh, are some of the criteria which basically affect the uh, compressive strength of the brick masonry. Now, I will come to the discussion of the elastic mo mo modulus of uh, the brick and the mortar uh, at a later stage as to how important they are. However, uh, the compressive strength of the brick plays a very important role in designing the, uh, des uh, the strength of the brick masonry. It is being uh, said by A.W. Henry, uh, who is considered to be the father of uh, masonry uh, studies. Uh, uh, that uh, compressive strength of the brick, uh, the brick masonry is, is proportional to the square root of the compressive strength of the brick. However, 
the uh, compressive strength of the brick masonry as concerned to the composition uh, the compressive strength of the mortar uh, varies by com uh, proportionally by about third root or fourth root of the mortar strength so basically brick becomes more important uh, uh, as far as the strength uh, compressive strength uh, is concerned in deciding the brick masonry itself uh, regarding the type and size, what kind of types uh, of bricks are available, we will discuss that uh, in a few minutes. However, as the size of the masonry unit increases, uh, the strength of the masonry is found to be um, increasing is uh, what the uh, research says. As far as mortar is concerned, the uh, various other properties of mortars are what kind of composition we use. Uh, what is the thickness of the mortar, which is also important? We see uh, in practice uh, that the, the thickness of the mortar varies anywhere from 20 to 25 mm. However, uh, a majority of the research has shown that the thickness of the mortar should not increase by 10 to 12 mm. Uh, and as the thickness goes beyond 12 mm, the strength of the masonry uh, reduces is uh, what uh, research has already shown. However, we are uh, nonetheless very indifferent to the kind of uh, uh, practice that we do that uh, er erratically the sizes of the bricks are different within the masonry the sizes and the thickness of the mortar uh, varies uh, drastically from one end to the other within a particular wall itself is uh, are some of the sad facts uh, uh, this is basically because as i say masonry has not been considered as a structural element Again, elastic modulus of mortar is important. Why is it important? I will not discuss it now, but at a later stage. Again, the compressive strength of mortar uh, also uh, is, is a matter of fact, uh, an important character, but not as much as that of the brick masonry. And uh, when uh, masonry is being constructed, the strength of the masonry is basically dependent on the various bonding arrangements. Uh, we have learned uh, in the in, in building construction the various bonding techniques as to English bond, Flemish bond, dry trap bond, cavity bonds, garden wall bonds, Flemish bonds, double Flemish bond, single Flemish bond. But uh, we have never explored as to what are the kind of strength criteria for various kinds of bonding arrangement or irrespective of the bond, whether the masonry gives the same strength is something which has never been uh, explored in any of the books uh, as a matter of fact and thereby the research remains uh, into the research papers and uh, even do not come in the textbook is a sad part uh, the other criteria is the brick mortar flexural bond uh, the strength of the brick and the sense of the mortar are important but uh, let us take an imaginary uh, situation. The mortar is also very, very strong. In that case, the kind of uh, stresses that are uh, uh, occurring into the uh, wall, depending on whether it is only axially loaded or uh, laterally loaded, in such cases, the flexural bond or the interface uh, bond between the brick and the mortar also plays a very important characteristic in deciding the brick masonry strength. Uh, in fact, the brick and the mortar may not fail, but the interface between the brick and the mortar may sometimes fail and may lead to the failure of the masonry itself is some kind of studies which we also look at. And uh, finally, the direction of the uh, loading on the wall uh, also becomes important whether the uh, wall is actually loaded. Uh, nonetheless, uh, never are ideal conditions like the wall is actually loaded prevails in practice. Uh, there would always be certain kind of eccentricity and also uh, the kind of uh, lateral loadings uh, uh, in terms of a freestanding wall uh, like a compound wall may always be subjected to some kind of lateral uh, stresses uh, uh, based on accidental loads or an, and definitely in, in an earthquake a building is uh, uh, it, it moves in loading and within the lateral loading again which walls are subjected to in plane and out of something which uh, define the direction of the stress within the masonry so these are basically the various uh, factors which control uh, ultimately the compressive strength of the brick masonry uh, in short 
Now, as far as uh, the characteristics of BRICS are concerned, details uh, uh, of everything, because I will not just uh, discuss and getting into the masonry buildings, but then in short, we have three different kinds of BRICS that are available in India. We categorize them as country brick, table molded brick, and wire cut brick. And as you can see, the quality basically the quality goes on improving, and the best quality is available in wire cut bricks. But however, the availability of wire cut bricks are only in a few uh, states like Kerala or basically the coastal areas of Karnataka, like Mangalore, uh, Karwar, etc. And uh, rarely do we find any wire cut bricks uh, being uh, manufactured in Maharashtra uh, as a state, uh, except in a few uh, districts uh, in the northern, uh, in the eastern belt, I'm uh, oh, sorry, the western belt like Jalgaon, uh, then uh, Nagpur, etc. Uh, but however, you will not see that wire cut bricks are uh, any of the other districts uh, in Maharashtra. Uh, however, Table molded bricks are basically used largely, and uh, the quality of these, uh, uh, as uh, as I said, that the country brick is the least uh, in quality, where table molded bricks are moderate and wire cut bricks are the best uh, that are available. But then, just by saying that they are moderate and best, it doesn't give any kind of technical information, and uh, the, the various um, uh, other information as to what does the IS code say regarding the various kinds of clay content for manufacturing of uh, these bricks have been given, which I will not dwell into uh, right now. However, uh, the two basic uh, requirements for a good brick is basically the raw materials uh, in terms of uh, the kind of kaolinitic clay that is required and uh, basically the kind of firing characteristics, whether they are burnt in kilns, they are burnt in uh, the local bhattis like clamps, uh, are something which basically uh, make out the ultimate quality of the brick. Uh, as far as the characteristics of bricks are concerned, uh, I am showing you a map as to what all information is available today. Uh, about the bricks in different uh, areas of our country. And uh, all the places that I have shown in this map is basically uh, where the bricks have been tested during some of my studies and during the uh, past studies done by somebody else. So all the red uh, areas basically uh, located are studies which have been taken by other uh, literature or other people who have researched into it. And uh, some of uh, the blue uh, uh, areas are some of earlier studies and the current studies which uh, we have been involved. So we have uh, areas almost representing all over uh, uh, the country. Uh, like we have uh, in, in Kerala, we have Calicut, Trishur, Bangalore, Harihar in Karnataka, Sangli, Pune in uh, uh, Maharashtra, Bombay, Aurangabad, Parbani, Latur are some places in Maharashtra, Ahmedabad in Gujarat, Jaipur in Rajasthan, Kanpur, Patna, Midnapur in West Bengal, Rurki. So they are basically representatives of states, you can say, although uh, just a, a, a sample may not uh, uh, be categorized as a representation of a particular area, but at a large, as, as the country is also large, let us first look at um, what are the characteristics of uh, the various bricks that are available in different states. Can we make out any information as a regional culture that uh, the regional characteristics that we can find out from these is something that uh, we will uh, discuss um, in a couple of uh, minutes now. Now, this table shows you the various table modeled bricks of Southern Peninsula, India. And when I say Southern Peninsula, it is the down states from Maharashtra, Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, and Kerala. And uh, some of the bricks that have been tested has been shown in this table, where uh, a larger part of bricks from Bangalore, Harihar from Karnataka, Trishur uh, from Kerala, Vijayawada and Vizag from Andhra Pradesh, and uh, two samples from Maharashtra were tested. And uh, all the values are basically uh, uh, an FR2 samples that were tested. Basically, larger number of samples were tested to get an average uh, value. As you can see, uh, most of the codal provisions and water absorption, but there are a few important characteristics that we basically uh, also have uh, uh, tried to uh, explore here. See the compressive strength, and when I say compressive strength of brick, it is basically as per the codal provisions. 
you dip the uh, brick in water for uh, 24 minimum 24 hours and then test it in wet condition uh, for its strength that you can uh, get from uh, any building unit and thereby the wet compressive uh, bricks of the uh, peninsula southern peninsula region spills to about 8.3 megapascals so the range of two and a half to eight and a half uh, megapascals are the kind of strengths that are available in the southern peninsula states uh, and uh, when you compare the strengths with that of the western countries uh, it is uh, uh, the bricks of uh, US or other Western countries, they start from with 10 megapascals as the minimum value. So basically, we are in a, a lower zone. Uh, the highest strength of ours is the lowest strength of the Western uh, building units uh, that are generally being observed. The other uh, uh, common characteristics that we also see is the water absorption, although the code says that up to class uh, 12 and half the water absorption uh, allowed permissible is about uh, 20 percent and about 12 and half class uh, as per is 1077 about 12 and half uh, class of brick uh, that is bricks having 12 and half megapascals and above should have a water absorption less than 15 percent and uh, as you can see majority of the uh, bricks although show a lower absorption than 20 percent we can see uh, bricks of maharashtra show a very very high water absorption of 22 and 26 percent uh, irrespective of that we have been largely using bricks uh, 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 in spite of very very low compressive strength and high water absorption which uh, nonetheless uh, uh, doesn't satisfy any codal provisions but then saying based on the criteria of uh, Sangri and Pune, I cannot come to a conclusion that all the bricks in the state of Maharashtra are poor. But then for this, we further explored by uh, bringing bricks from different districts of Maharashtra and uh, the results uh, still and, uh, were observed to be the same, that the bricks uh, showed a very, very high water absorption and uh, very moderate, low and low to moderate kind of strengths where uh, none of the bricks uh, crossed um, uh, compressive strength of uh, about five or six megapascals uh, uh, in majority of the districts. Uh, so that is the kind of uh, water absorption and uh, the density of the bricks also are in the range of about 13.3 uh, kilonewton per cubic meter to a maximum of about 19 and a half kilonewton per cubic meter although uh, we cannot uh, draw a judgment that higher the density higher is the compressive strength because you can see that uh, somewhere where the densities are high the compressive strength can be low this basically is basically because uh, the uh, other characteristics of how the material is vitrified during high temperatures what is the temperature of burning etc do con uh, as a control over how the strength of the brick is basically being uh, achieved however some of the other uh, characteristics which are important in this material are uh, what i have been looking at as ira and soaking duration ira is basically a very important property which are basically being uh, covered up in the western codes uh, ASTM C67 gives you about IRA as one of the inevitable tests to be done on building units uh, in the US. However, uh, there is no uh, mention of any such kind of a property or characteristics to be evaluated in the Indian codal provisions. This is where being done. IRA seems to be an important property and IRA initial rate of absorption can be defined as the amount of water that is absorbed by the base of the brick uh, when uh, subjected uh, into water for 3 mm in a 3 mm pool of water for a period of one minute. So it is a very simple test that can be performed uh, on, the, on the sites where a brick can be placed in a small pool of 3 mm pool of water for a period of one minute and uh, you can see what is the uh, what was the dry weight and the uh, uh, weight of water that has been absorbed in the duration of one minute and that absorption in expressed as amount of water in kgs per meter square that is the bed surface of the brick uh, for one minute duration is what is being suggested here why is this duration important uh, you can see that majority of the bricks show uh, an IRA in between value of one and half to three or three and half. 
Whereas again, bricks which had very high water absorption also show a very high IRA in terms of 7 to 9 kg per meter square per minute, which means that higher the value, the brick has a higher capacity of absorbing water within a small duration of time. And this becomes very, very important as far as whether you keep use dry bricks or completely separate saturated by the performance of the mortar where the brick can absorb all the water from the mortar and thereby improper hydration of the mortar can lead to an improper masonry uh, performance is something that IRA becomes important and thereby uh, the condition of the brick that is to be used during construction is neither the brick should be completely saturated nor the brick should be completely dry uh, and thereby they are uh, the bricks need to be partially saturated otherwise if you go to some of the textbooks uh, when we uh, when you read uh, it is said that bricks are to be uh, overnight uh, drenched in in a water tank before it is being used for construction or uh, nobody talks about what what should be the kind of moisture content in the brick during the construction this is basically because uh, uh, it's an important property because uh, there should be uh, no complete absorption of the water from the mortar into the brick. And at the same time, it should be partially saturated because some of the uh, cement paste needs to get into the needle-like pores of the brick uh, of the bed surface so that they form a needle-like structure. And the bonding is not just because of uh, mechanical bonding that the mortar enters into the frog of the brick but it is also due to a chemical kind of bonding because of the cement paste entering into the pores and thereby once the cement uh, uh, paste hardens then thereby a, a appropriate kind of a mechanical uh, bonding uh, and as well as a chemical bonding the soaking during appropriate soaking duration is what is being given so in in this table you can see a uh, brick which uh, has a water absorption of somewhere less than 20 require a kind of uh, soaking duration of 10 to 15 minutes on the contrary if the soaking if the water absorption is very very large more than 20 percent in that case uh, the soaking duration is very small like uh, three to five minutes and the soaking more than uh, 10 or 15 minutes may saturate the brick uh, in such conditions and thereby may adversely affect the masonry strength itself. On the contrary, if you look at the uh, bricks of uh, northern uh, India, uh, Ahmedabad, Jaipur, Patna, Jammu, also some of the bricks of uh, West Bengal and Kashmir were also tested. Uh, but then because the number of samples were less, um, uh, I have not... Uh, uh, wherever the brick samples were less because transporting and bringing them uh, was a bit uh, difficult and thereby uh, I have not, uh, although they were tested and Patna gave a strength of about 15 megapascals and Ahmedabad also gave a very good strength, more than 10 megapascals. However, as the representation is not of large number of samples, I have not referred them here. However, you can see that the composition strength is more than 10 MPA, uh, unlike in case of bricks of peninsular regions. And thereby, uh, you can have a regional kind of a trend that northern bricks are uh, somewhat uh, stronger in compressive strength as compared to that of southern peninsular bricks. Also, you can see that the density is much more than what we generally saw uh, in these cases. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, the water absorptions are much, much lesser. The wire cut bricks of southern peninsular regions, that is from Bangalore and uh, Kerala, that Kananur is Udagamandala. And uh, you can see the uh, compressive strengths are much, much higher. And the soaking duration of such bricks uh, become higher because the water absorption are lower. And uh, these wire cut bricks are basically uh, to be soaked in water for partial saturation up to one hour, about 45 to 45 minutes to 60 minutes is something, uh, is a summary of all these, uh, although I take a lot of time in explaining this, but then today it is not the context of just uh, discussing about the material. Another important feature is the elastic modulus, which we never explore as undergraduate or postgraduate students. Uh, we, we are very well known about, we, we know very well about the elastic modulus of concrete, 5,700 root FCK and all these kind of um, empirical relations being uh, uh, known in order to estimate uh, elastic modulus. But however, 
uh, I would not go with this value very strictly, basically because the sample switch value. But however, uh, uh, point to be noted is it may not be uh, uh, the error may not be about fifty percent. It could be a five percent here and five percent to ten percent here and there. But however, a very very unusual kind of in case of uh, bridge from Patna. Uh, and also the value of 3000 to 5000. So you can see a situation as I was saying that elastic modulus I will be discussing a little later, but then you can keep in mind that the elastic modulus of uh, bricks are somewhere about maximum 1000 MPa, whereas the uh, uh, wire cut bricks uh, uh, have uh, slightly higher modulus of about 3000 uh, to 5000 MPa. Nonetheless, none of the bricks in India would go beyond 3000 or 5000 MPa is something what we are almost sure of today. The other uh, material which are basically involved in mortars are uh, uh, the, the matrix uh, that are involved in the mortar for binding the uh, building unit value. Uh, the strengths and uh, elastic modulus have been uh, summarized into this table. Uh, I have uh, tried to test various kinds of mortars. Uh, basically, a rich mortar of 1 is to 4, cement, lime, soil, and sand are the kind of designations that have been utilized here. So, 1 of cement is to 4 is basically a very, very uh, rich mortar, I would say. Whereas the normal kind of conventional mortar that we use in, a, in, in the Indian context is one is to six, one of cement and six of sand. On the contrary, uh, some combination mortars, which sometimes are much better than these exclusive mortars of cement or lime, uh, is also being tried out like one of cement, one of lime and six of sand and one of cement, six of soil and uh, nine of sand have been used as combination mortars. Also some of the, uh, but most of these mortars have been tried out by different authors like Sanandupani, Pandari, Ilanganmani, uh, long back. And you can see a various uh, variation in the compressive strength uh, of uh, uh, about 1 is to 6 conventional gives you about, conventional mortar gives you about 7 megapascals. Uh, and uh, the elastic modulus here you can see is somewhere about 8,000, 9,000 and about 8000 MPa, 6000 MPa. So you can see most of the mortars that we use have a very, very high elastic modulus, whereas the brick never crosses about 3000 uh, uh, MPa in our case. And thereby we have a very, very soft brick and a very strong mortar in most of the uh, Indian masonry is what you can basically summarized from the data that I am trying to present. Even some of the studies which was being done uh, by me is 1 is to 6 cement model gave a elastic models of 9000 and uh, other combination model as to 1 of cement, half of uh, lime and 4 of uh, sand. Uh, and various other combination combination mortars, a very, very weak mortar, like one of cement and 15 of soil and five of sand, purposely chosen to see uh, the weakest kind of mortar that uh, uh, I would I could have tested beyond this was mud, pure mud mortar itself. So the weakest kind of mortar, uh, which gave a very, very low compressive strength of 0 0.6, still gave an initial tangent modulus of 238 megapascals. So you can see majority of the uh, cement, pure cement mortars have a plastic modulus higher than 5000 to 10,000, whereas uh, other kinds of uh, softer mortars uh, still have one, one to six gives uh, elastic modulus of uh, 5,500 uh, and 169 gives you an elastic model of 1,500 megapascal. So basically it is very important uh, also in, in a composite uh, uh, component like masonry where you have two different kinds of materials involved. Uh, however, their properties are also very uh, anisotropic or non-homogeneity is being uh, seen in, in, in different uh, directions when tested, uh, like in brick units. In such cases, uh, masonry analysis becomes very, very complex uh, when it is uh, looked at as a structural component. So that is uh, what uh, basically uh, the raw material characteristics are. So based on these uh, kind of data, when you try to look at the uh, experimental uh, studies of uh, compressive strength, uh, basically, wallets uh, are recommended by the uh, 
British standards, whereas in Indian standards, it is the prisms uh, that are being recommended for testing of the masonry strength. Uh, this is one of the uh, setups of the um, wallet strengths to assess the wallet strengths, where high strength uh, masonry probably need to be supported uh, laterally so that there is no toppling over or the buckling of the masonry does not occur when it is actually compressed. Uh, if the bricks are of, bricks and mortar are of, are of very high strength, it was observed that the wall uh, basically tries to topple down uh, rather than uh, get crushed um, uh, and the realistic kind of uh, compressive strength does not occur and thereby two rollers are basically being fixed. Why I am highlighting this is these are some of the experimental studies that we basically need to concentrate on uh, with moderate strength bricks that we get in our areas is something that uh, we need to explore further. And thereby, based on some of these kind of studies, uh, like you can see some of the uh, realistic experimental setups uh, that are being done for the compressive studies. Uh, various kinds of different mortars were uh, utilized for different kinds of uh, uh, a different uh, strength of the brick. Here the brick was 5.7 megapascals uh, in common for all the studies and different kinds of uh, uh, mortars, 115.5, a very um, soft mortar and a very rich mortar of 1 is to 6 and a moderate combination mortar of 169 were utilized for all the studies and uh, the masonry strengths were basically, these, these were the wet compressive strength of the uh, masonry wallets, but then these are not the representative masonry strength. The further normalized compressive strength is the representative of the wall strength or the masonry strength as per the codal provision, where the actual strength that are being uh, evaluated from the experimental studies are further subjected to certain correction factors as per the codal provisions, like IS 1905 suggests you that uh, depending on the kind of size of the wallet, uh, the prism what kind of correction factors are to be adopted and thereby the further normalized uh, um, the masonry efficiency is something that is evaluated by uh, looking at what is the normalized compressive strength by applying the correction factor to the wet compressive strength of the wallets or the prisms and how the uh, failures of the wallets occurred. I will not go into the details of this but then there is something where masonry efficiency gives you what is masonry defined as the strength of the uh, ratio of the strength of the brick to the strength of the wall and thereby it is uh, said that if you have a masonry efficiency of 21 percent it means that the strength of the wall would be about 21 percent as compared to that of the strength of the brick unit that you are using and thereby uh, the masonry efficiency is something which gives you an indication of what the strength of the walls would be. So based on the various kinds of studies done by all these people, uh, an empirical uh, relation can be achieved uh, based on the data of brick strength to mortar strength. So if you have, if you know the strength of the brick and you know the strength of the mortar, uh, the ratio of this is what will define uh, the scale on the x-axis in a semi-logarithmic uh, um, uh, nature and uh, the y-axis defines the masonry efficiency that is the brick strength divided by the wall strength and thereby the various kinds of uh, uh, points show you uh, the best fit and you can see that the variance is quite a lot the standard deviation is quite varying this is basically because the material of the brick itself has a large variation if you test about 15 bricks probably the standard deviation could go anywhere about 30 to 35 percent even depending on whether it's a wire cut brick or a table molded brick or a country brick uh, in wire cut brick this variance could be seen to be less about 9 to 10 percent However, table molded brick can go anywhere 20 to 25 percent, which are basically non -engineered, engineeredly fired um, in appropriate kind of temperatures are uh, uh, reached. In such cases, uh, the variation can be very, very high. So, thereby, uh, as uh, you can see, we consider reinforced concrete and concrete to be a very homogeneous material uh, exhibiting uh, homogeneous properties. However, this becomes very, very difficult in case of brick masonry and thereby the kind of uh, analysis that we need to do using finite element analysis using NISA or ANSYS becomes very, very tough. Basically because the 
defining the boundary conditions uh, between the brick and the mortar becomes so difficult in different areas because of this wide variation itself is uh, is a very complex kind of analysis um, and thereby very few studies on such kind of things are basically observed now i was telling you about uh, the various uh, uh, effects of uh, the elastic modulus i will not get into the results but i will try to induct the principle behind why elastic modulus becomes important than the compressive strength when let us say we consider a situation where uh, the the mortar is of low modulus or mortar is softer than the brick uh, where the elastic modulus of brick is very high and the uh, uh, elastic modulus of uh, uh, the mortar is very uh, low relatively low than the brick in such cases when it is actually loaded what happens the deformations that occur that the, the mortar tries to expand much more than that of the brick because of the variation in the elastic modulus however I expect that the masonry behaves as one and thereby an equilibrium needs to be achieved and thereby what happens is the brick, uh, the mortar undergoes a compressive strain in the mortar which means that this condition needs to be achieved which means that the mortar needs to be undergoing a compressive strain uh, and uh, the brick on the contrary has to get into a tensile strain into the brick and thereby this is one of the main reasons why the uh, brick masonry you don't see any kind of crushing unless and until the compressive strength of the brick unit are very very low but then the uh, most of the uh, failures in the brick masonry are basically due to splitting tension and this splitting tension is something is because of the tensile strain in the brick basically because of the difference in the elastic modular moduli of two different materials that we use in terms of mortar matrix and brick is why it occurs and thereby uh, it is very important to see that the elastic modulus of the mortar and the brick uh, are uh, matching uh, to the same and thereby in indian conditions where the bricks are of very very low uh, elastic modulus and the cement mortar one is to six gives you nine thousand megapascal. A reverse kind of situations also may occur uh, in the majority of countries. So this is the basic fundamental of how elastic theory can be applied uh, in cer certain kinds of brick masonry. The other uh, uh, idea behind uh, assessing, as I was telling you, if the brick and the mortar is very very strong, in that case the interface between the brick and the mortar also is important and thereby there are studies like modify, a modified flexural bond test which can be uh, conducted in order to see what is the interfacial strength and it is being seen that for various different kinds of mortars and for a particular brick strength the uh, average compressive strength and the flexural bond strength uh, were basically being evaluated you can uh, have a flexural bond strength of about 0 0.01, 0 0.1 to about 0 0.03 uh, is something that you can see. Uh, the maximum amount of uh, uh, 0.156 is the maximum flexural bond strength that you have uh, uh, achieved here. With a combination mod of 1 to 5, you have 0 0.2 uh, megapascals. So you can have a range of flexural bond strength varying from the lowest value of 0 0.03 to 0 0.2 megapascals uh, in most of the uh, table molded brick masonries and uh, various kinds of mortars. On the contrary, their uh, uh, corresponding compressive strengths also have been plotted here. So in case of uh, strong bricks, uh, you can see that uh, the, the relation between the flexural bond strength and the masonry compressive strength can be established which are basically uh, proportional uh, uh, and gives you almost a kind of a straight line relationship. However, uh, if, uh, in, in case of uh, very soft uh, bricks, you can see that the flexural bond strength relation with masonry compressive strength is uh, slightly non-linear and uh, lower strengths uh, basically are uh, something which do not uh, give you a very proportionate kind of relationship. So that is the first part uh, which I wanted to first uh, get into uh, where I would summarize that the compressive strengths of table molded bricks from North India are in the range of 8 to 20 megapascals and have an elastic modulus in the range of 2000 to 15000 megapascals in general inclusive of table molded 
and wire cut bricks. The table walled bricks of coastal and southern peninsular regions of India have strengths in the range of 3.5 to 11 megapascals and elastic modulus in the range of 300 to 1000 megapascals only. The wire cut bricks in these regions are relatively superior having compressive strengths between 10 to 23 megapascals and elastic modulus in the range of uh, 3000 to 5000 megapascals. The table molded bricks need a pre-soaking period of 5 to 20 minutes whereas the wire cut bricks need a soaking period of 45 to 15 minutes, 60 minutes before uh, laying it into the construction. The conventional cement mortar and has elastic modulus uh, of the order of 7,000 to 9,000 megapascal, which are uh, basically higher than the elastic modulus of bricks in India, uh, which are limited to about 3,000 megapascals in general. Soft mortars could be obtained by adding lime or soil in cement mortars so as to achieve compatibility with the bricks. And uh, the irrespective of the brick strength, the use of cement mortar uh, of 1 is to 6, which is basically, which is conventionally being used, is poor, is, is uh, observed to give poor masonry bond strength in the range of only 0.08 to 0.1 megapascals. On the contrary, Combination mortars like cement soil sand mortars like 125 or 126 along with moderate strength uh, table molded bricks perform very well and exhibit uh, higher bond strengths in the range of 0.14 to 0.22 megapascals. In general, whenever the brick samples have large coefficient of variation, the weakest brick in the masonry element determines the masonry strength rather than the interaction between the brick and the mortar. This appears to be clearly demonstrated in the table molded brick masonry elements tested, especially in masonry specimens with a relatively large number of bricks. The relative, uh, relative to the stack bonded specimens, the lower masonry efficiency in case of English bonded masonry uh, is not very conclusive in the Indian context, although Western uh, values are very conclusive. But then uh, we have not been able to conclude on this. Uh, uh, aspect of stack bonded specimens. It is observed that the scatter in the strength values in the case of violets is lesser than that of the prisms and thereby uh, rather than testing prisms uh, or a relative um, comparison of the prism and uh, violet uh, testing needs to be done in order to uh, get a realistic value of uh, the masonry uh, rather than just depending on the prism strength. So that uh, constitutes my first part of the talk. Uh, it is uh, almost one hour that I have uh, uh, consumed. Uh, and uh, with that, let me enter into the second part of uh, today's uh, uh, lecture, which I will try to take uh, another half an hour or so. Uh, as far as uh, earthquakes are concerned, I generally uh, looking at the past data, there are uh, very uh, frequent kind of minor earthquakes that we see. Uh, moderate uh, earthquakes of the magnitude of uh, 5 to 6 are occasional and strong earthquakes uh, having uh, magnitudes of uh, 7, more than 7 uh, are very few uh, spread over the world but uh, are very, very rare. Uh, but then these strong earthquakes can create a walk whenever they occur is what we have observed. So the larger question lies, can buildings be designed for earthquake resistant fully? And when I say buildings, it is basically masonry buildings, it is uh, framed structures, it is RC frames and uh, the trusses, etc. Everything including, can buildings be designed for earthquake resistant fully? Well, and this word uh, fully is very, very important. Uh, a large amount of structural engineers will say that yes, we can today uh, construct uh, a, a earthquake resistant uh, building. But however, when it comes to the question of fully, can it uh, encounter any uh, earthquake of any magnitude? Probably the answer uh, may not be, we will not be ensuring any of such kind of uh, things as a structural engineer. And uh, basically our answers would be a no, no to this um, is what uh, uh, I perceive uh, as, as a very general kind of a question. Uh, basically, uh, everything is being controlled by the various uh, kinds of materials that I use. 
the kind of uh, cost uh, that and the economy that I need to achieve. Uh, if I go for a load bearing structures of 10 stories, then probably the, my masonry is going to be uh, one meter thick, uh, depending on the kind of building unit and the kind of model that I'm going to use. And my functional areas are going to be highly compromised. And thereby, there are various uh, uh, aspects as to why uh, buildings cannot be completely earthquake resistant uh, in general. Although the design philosophy uh, goes that uh, in case of minor earthquakes, structural members should not undergo any damage. However, non-structural members may sustain certain kind of repairable damage, like uh, the mortars, the plaster, the, uh, the walls may have slight small cracks. Uh, however, the conditions are like the minor repair cost uh, there is a minor uh, kind of a cost on the repairs need, uh, which, which can be done, uh, but the building is completely operational. On the contrary, moderate uh, kind of earthquakes, uh, you see that uh, the uh, structural members can undergo certain kind of repairable damage. Uh, there is a difference between what are repairs, what are uh, strengthening and what are retrofitting, which I will not uh, differentiate now, but they may sustain certain kind of repairable damage. Uh, whereas the non-structural members may sustain major damage, needs a certain kind of replacement, uh, or you need a certain kind of jacketing, uh, etc. in case of columns and so on. Uh, as far as the post earthquake conditions are uh, concerned, the moderate uh, kind of earthquakes, you generally see that the building is fully operational after strengthening techniques uh, are being carried out on the uh, damages that have occurred in the components. Whereas in case of strong earthquakes, uh, structural members um, uh, undergo severe irreparable damages, but uh, without collapse and basically require retrofitting measures so thereby repair strengthening and retrofitting are completely different uh, repair is something like a cosmetic kind of uh, uh, treatment that is basically being given whereas strengthening is something like uh, i can compare it with putting a plaster whenever there is a crack in your bone uh, so that you can bring it to its uh, operatable uh, operation conditions or you can walk after three weeks after the plaster is being removed, your leg has been strengthened. But uh, retrofit is something where you require much more strengthening than uh, the earlier kind of uh, uh, behavior of the components so that in any uh, occurrence of such kind of uh, loadings, uh, the element will not undergo any such kind of damage and thereby you need to get into retrofitting measures in order to strengthen the element more than what it was behaving earlier. So, this no, in, whereas in case of non-structural members, uh, in strong earthquakes, uh, the walls may completely topple down uh, in case of framed structures. However, they are non-structural members and thereby need to be replaced. Although dysfunctional, non-collapse will minimize fatality is uh, the kind of design philosophy that we need to generally follow. So, some damage is unavoidable is what we need to accept. Acceptable and unacceptable damages uh, are to be assessed, based, which are based, basically based on location, type, and size. And the designer needs to allow some predetermined parts to undergo acceptable type of damages by including, uh, by, uh, including or inducing ductility into the elements. And thereby, we come to this uh, uh, well-known statement, earthquakes do not kill people designers and buildings do so and uh, thereby uh, the various kinds of codes today help us in determining the various kinds of design strategies that are to be adopted in buildings however when it comes to masonry buildings uh, masonry buildings have been vulnerable uh, in indian constructions in the past uh, mix uh, the various uh, uh, damages that have occurred in the classical uh, earthquake of Latour uh, has been amply demonstrated uh, as to how masonry, uh, especially the um, random rubble masonry, which were prevalent in Latour uh, uh, during the earthquake in probably uh, 1983, 
uh, demonstrated by the damaging earthquake in Natur. However, it is not that only uh, non-engineered constructions uh, uh, got into damages. Uh, the latest uh, earthquake of Bhuj uh, uh, also showed that engineered buildings also underwent a large, large amount of damage. And uh, Bhuj, which uh, Ahmedabad, which was 400 kilometers away from Bhuj, uh, you could see a large number of uh, reinforced concrete buildings themselves uh, getting into uh, a lot of damages. So addressing uh, this uh, this issue uh, of damages in buildings and collapse of the buildings, these problems require various uh, works on uh, what what we basically need to do is to ensure that more and more constructions comply with the design and construction requirements of the building codes. We also need to develop uh, and propagate construction types. We need to devise various kinds of constructions. Uh, newly as and when such kind of uh, learnings are uh, occur during the earthquakes like Latur, Bhuj, Uttarkashi, Chamoli earthquakes, etc. A lot of things have been uh, learned um, and uh, some kind of techniques need to be uh, devised in order to see that buildings behave much better uh, in the future earthquakes is what basically uh, should be the kind of philosophy. The various kinds of typologies have been uh, getting changed over vernacularly and uh, a couple of examples are basically the uh, after the 1897 Assam earthquake there was a typical kind of Assam type of housing uh, which came into existence and uh, after the 1935 uh, Baluchistan earthquake in Pakistan uh, basically the Quetta bond was uh, tried out further which was basically a one and a half brick with uh, a cavity where the cavity was uh, uh, reinforced and concreted uh, in order to give the lateral kind of stability in order to increase the uh, out of plane behavior of the uh, walls is what you can uh, look at as construction typologies and uh, some of the uh, uh, techniques that uh, I spoke about, the Assam type of housing, where the masonry was basically housed into various kinds of wooden frames. And you can see, the, uh, although they were not structurally very, very um, large in cross section, but then a network of uh, uh, the wooden elements uh, wherein the masonry was basically constructed, uh, uh, acted, uh, the, the, the timber elements acted as reinforcement and basically it was some some kind of a confined kind of reinforcement which basically european uh, buildings also uh, have certain kind of similarity to this and uh, the kind of um, cavity uh, masonry which were explored after the uh, quetta earthquake uh, in pakistan uh, is uh, today in pakistan is what uh, are some of the typologies which have come into existence further now most of the buildings which are uh, uh, of the past uh, which are four stories in india are basically is seen to be built of uh, burnt clay bricks uh, with reinforced concrete slabs and uh, it is uh, the uh, the past uh, couple of decades uh, trend that we have been uh, uh, basically dependent more on reinforced concrete uh, structures uh, where we see we do not want to take risks on uh, 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 load bearing structures and thereby we say that uh, you build once in a lifetime buildings and thereby it is better that you go for reinforced concrete buildings. However, uh, depending on the building and the seismic zone of its location, certain earthquake resistance features uh, can also be basically uh, provided to uh, the various kinds of masonry uh, structures uh, and uh, Indian codes have been uh, recommending the lintel band, the corner reinforcement and uh, other kinds of uh, uh, portal provisions have also come into existence. Now one of the uh, uh, draft uh, guidelines uh, which was made by A.S. Arya, Teddy uh, Boyen and Yuji Ishiyama, uh, you can freely download this copy of guidelines for earthquake resistant non-engineered construction which is available if you can google with this uh, 
title of guidelines for earthquake resistant non-engineered construction by ASRI. You will get this copy. Uh, also, there are various kinds of um, uh, total provisions which have come out now, IS 13827, uh, the improvements of earthquake uh, resistance of uh, urban buildings, similarly improvements in earthquake resistance of low structural masonry buildings is what is spoken in uh, IS uh, 13828 and so on. Uh, so, I will not go into the details of the each and every uh, total provisions, but I would like to uh, uh, dwell upon what other countries also do. So, basically, uh, depending on the kind of uh, uh, suggestions that have been given by the Indian total provisions, uh, some seismic features are often not provided in these buildings due to a variety of uh, reasons. There are various practical reasons, even if you have seen that uh, the column beam junction needs to be appropriately reinforced with stirrups. Uh, however, we see that there is always uh, a, a gap in between the provision of the stirrups or the rings that are ba basically provided at the junction of the beams and the columns. And uh, these are the vulnerable areas uh, during the lateral movement uh, during earthquakes, uh, which are which become very, very uh, uh, brittle and thereby the joints give off. So similarly, the kind of locking mechanisms within the masonry uh, corners, etc., become very important. And uh, uh, a number of uh, buildings in urban areas are now tending to include a number of small reinforced concrete columns. One would combine these building elements into a rational structural system of uh, what are basically uh, today uh, well known as confined masonry, which uh, have far better earthquake performance uh, relatively. And uh, many new uh, four to five story reinforced concrete frame buildings are being constructed in small and large towns. Uh, uh, however, they lack a proper frame system and uh, either they do not undergo any formal structural engineering or an inappropriate kind of structural engineering where thumb roots are basically being used and either the sections given are so large that uh, they are out of uh, economy or uh, basically you can see that uh, they do not uh, appropriately or there is an inappropriate kind of behavior during any such kind of uh, lateral uh, loads that occur during the earthquakes. It is fortunate that uh, uh, we do not get earthquakes frequently um, and uh, thereby uh, the kind of damages uh, that we see are uh, very, very infrequent in our buildings. Most of the 130 multi-storied apartment buildings was demonstrated that collapse in Ahmedabad in 2001 earthquake fall uh, was uh, basically in the RC buildings itself. And thereby, uh, it should be possible to construct uh, these kind of apartment buildings in uh, what are called as confined masonry without incurring additional costs and without uh, having to go for various other kinds of new building materials. Now, uh, some of the documents, these figures I have taken from NPEEE, which are some of the best figures that I have seen for simple explanation as to how masonry behave. And uh, you can have uh, very nice notes of NPEEE uh, that was basically being floated by IIT Kanpur. And uh, I would recommend everybody to go through, there are 24 such kind of small documents uh, which are very, very nicely explained. And uh, masonry, although are considered to be brittle structures, uh, there are large amount of inertial forces that uh, basically travel from uh, the roof uh, to the walls and to the foundation. All the walls uh, basically are subjected to in-plane as well as out-of-plane forces during an earthquake. And uh, if they are appropriately locked at the junctions, where basically your bonding uh, uh, plays an important role, what kind of bondings have been uh, incorporated, like whether it's an English or a Flemish or a single Flemish or a double Flemish bond, uh, basically the locking of the junctions uh, have a control. and. Uh, if restricted in the length of the wall itself by providing various kinds of uh, braces, pilasters, and cross walls, we can see that these walls uh, get subjected to out of plane direction uh, and get good lateral resistance. Like the wall here shown in this uh, uh, in this uh, structure, uh, these walls basically undergo bending, and uh, when the earthquake is acting in this direction, 
these walls which are basically uh, parallel to the uh, wave or the direction of the earthquake shaking uh, is basically something uh, which is uh, which induces in plane stresses whereas the walls which are perpendicular to the direction of the earthquake uh, are subjected to bending and uh, as we see that uh, the load that occurs the shaking that occurs um, uh, in plane with that of the wall uh, that is in the direction of the earthquake are basically relatively much stronger show better resistance as compared to walls uh, which are loaded basically out of plane or the direction of earthquake shaking is perpendicular to the uh, the plane of the wall itself and thereby the wall connections become very important uh, especially in the uh, junctions also the recommendations of the running of the rc bands at various levels and uh, it is basically the codal provisions today recommend uh, rc band at the uh, plinth level at the sill level the lintel level and at the roof level uh, uh, generally we see that uh, the uh, lintels are uh, individual uh, to the openings and it is recommended that the rc bands are run all over the walls at the lintel level uh, becoming a reinforced concrete kind of a band which basically restricts the development of cracks uh, from one zone to the other uh, and thereby try to uh, uh, not uh, they control the propagation of the cracks throughout the uh, component and thereby restrict uh, the damages so running of rc bands at various levels is very very important in case of uh, especially load bearing structures uh, it is recommended architecturally that uh, openings are small uh, you can provide large number of uh, number of openings but the area of the openings need to be smaller in order to control the damages uh, the limitations in the length to thickness ratio and the height to thickness ratios become important in uh, the better resistance of uh, uh, masonry structures in earthquake and thereby uh, the choice and quality of materials uh, need to be looked at in terms of porosity of the building unit pre-soaking period as i was telling you in the static characteristics of the uh, raw materials and the unit mortar bonding and the cement uh, combination mortars rather than going for individual lime mortar or cement mortar it is better to go for a combination uh, of cement lime mortar is uh, is observed to be uh, a better kind of uh, uh, matrix that are to be used uh, in masonry structures so the failures uh, that have been uh, looked at uh, various reasons for failures in masonry buildings, uh, especially uh, in the Buj or Latur earthquakes, uh, where we had uh, basically explored uh, the reasons for failure uh, in some of the areas, Anjar and uh, other places. Uh, buildings uh, did not behave uh, like a strong box, basically because the junctions were not adequately strength uh, strong enough basically in especially in latur there were a random rubble kind of stones which were which did not have appropriate kind of bond stones uh, basically the elements were slender or uh, very heavy walls inertial forces were high use of mud mortars uh, was one of the prime reasons in latur earthquake uh, damages huge mass of masonry uh, which uh, induced large inertial forces inadequate bonding as i was telling you as uncoarse random rubble or brick masonry inappropriate corner strengthenings corner failures eccentric placement of uh, door openings all these uh, were some of the basic reasons why uh, failures occurred uh, in, and and if these kind of uh, uh, cares are basically being taken uh, with certain kind of uh, reinforcements which i would be discussing ahead a uh, re reinforced uh, load bearing structure also uh, behave much much better uh, and how much better is what we will see a little later so thereby various kinds of structural configurations uh, like um, buildings need to be uh, symmetrical uh, also basically the corners need to be strengthened uh, and uh, the openings the uh, the placement of uh, the openings uh, very near to the edge of the walls etc and the uh, elements like staircases etc which basically absorb a large amount of energy during the uh, earthquake movements 
uh, would be vulnerable areas uh, which need to be appropriately taken care of. The figures are self-explanatory and thereby you can go through them in, in detail. And thereby some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, in, uh, inductions of the uh, role of horizontal banks like rental banks, even uh, the uh, sill banks also become uh, very important uh, in case of uh, uh, three-story or four-story building. Uh, like you, uh, you can see, the majority of the damages that occurred in school buildings uh, uh, during the Kilari earthquake uh, and Buja earthquake, you can see uh, there was no, there were independent lintels, and thereby uh, either uh, the, the trusses fell off and uh, the various walls, uh, which underwent damages, were basically continued to the base, basically because there were no reinforced concrete bands which were provided uh, as these were ancient kind of buildings. So uh, thereby. Some of the kind of failures uh, uh, can be also avoided by providing vertical reinforcement and that is where we come into confined masonry or reinforced masonry are some of the new trends uh, where uh, studies are basically going on uh, in, in some institutes um, as to how masonry will behave with uh, different kind of uh, reinforcement pattern uh, which I will explain at the end. So basically when uh, the openings become larger, the masonry uh, elements become individualistic and uh, basically there is a rocking of masonry because of the uh, change in the direction of the earthquake uh, shaking. Basically, uh, they, they, uh, the elements try to rock and roll and thereby the rocking of the pier will induce concentration of stresses and uh, the very next moment when the direction of the earthquake changes, naturally uh, the, uh, the, the, the diagonal stresses are basically uh, taken care of by this diagonal because of the rocking of the elements. And thereby you can see that various kinds of cracks are basically look, uh, can be observed into such kind of elements because However, these cracks do not develop further into the masonry either below the sill or above the lintel uh, basically because of the existence of the sill band or the lintel bands is what uh, basically become important. So these uh, bands are to be reinforced uh, uh, concrete and uh, basically the vertical reinforcement uh, at the edges of the openings and at the corners of the walls, the junctions, are also something which uh, uh, give a better resistance and thereby vertical reinforcement uh, uh, which causes bending of the masonry piers uh, in place of rocking and thereby such kind of rocking behavior is avoided by providing uh, the uh, uh, reinforced concrete elements uh, from the base of your plinth beam to the uh, roof beam is what is expected but uh, the care that needs to be taken is this reinforcement cannot be independent of the masonry. At every few courses of the masonry, they are to be interlocked. Now, this reinforcement and the reinforcement at the back of the wall uh, in plane of this reinforcement need to be connected together, which constitutes the uh, containment reinforcement and thereby its upper, the energy absorption of such kind of buildings becomes much, much better. So with that we come to the, uh, the the concept of confined masonry. The confined masonry construction consists of uh, basically masonry walls and horizontal and vertical reinforced concrete confining elements built on all four sides of the masonry wall panel. So although this figure looks like a reinforced concrete uh, uh, frame, the structure, but it is not. It is a typical confined masonry building where the masonry is confined into the elements and uh, the difference between a reinforced concrete framed structure and a confined element masonry building is that the columns are not designed for the complete actual loads that come onto uh, through the slab uh, which means that 
in the RC frame structure, the column is uh, a complete element which basically uh, through which the, uh, uh, the vertical loads are basically being transferred. However, in case of confined masonry, it is not just the column, but it is a hybrid construction of the walls as well as the uh, smaller sectional columns which are basically housed together and thereby it is not a complete framed element, it is a hybrid kind of a construction. So the vertical and horizontal members called as vertical ties, I do not call them as columns, but they are called as vertical ties and horizontal ties, they confine the masonry in between. And in the, however, this is different from the reinforced masonry construction that vertical reinforcement mainly resists the effects of axial load and bending, whereas the horizontal reinforcement resists the shear in reinforced concrete elements. Whereas in case of the confining members, these are basically effective because and these enhance the stability and integrity of the masonry walls for in-plane and out-of-plane earthquake loads. These enhance the strength of masonry walls under lateral earthquake loads and it is observed that reducing the brittleness of the masonry wall under earthquake loads uh, is observed uh, in such kind of elements and hence there is an improvement in their earthquake performance. Now, the difference that needs to be looked at is, it should be noted that the term confined masonry is used in a general sense for different forms of masonry construction, reinforced with additional steel, timber, it could be timber also as in case of Assam uh, uh, construction that I showed earlier, uh, some type of housing, or it could be of uh, concrete elements also. So, some of the uh, constructions that you hybrid construction as i was saying uh, you can see here uh, some of the areas like slovenia el salvador indonesia canada or some of the other european countries you can see that uh, the vertical element the reinforced concrete uh, element uh, i don't call this as a column but it is a tie vertical tie and the horizontal tie are basically where the masonry is basically confined with, which means that the column is constructed earlier and the masonry is being constructed later on in RC frameworks. Uh, however, in case of such hybrid construction, the masonry as well as the columns uh, basically are cast together and you can see that this face of masonry and this face of masonry are basically the two sides of the column uh, to be casted and the other two lateral sides are adjacent sides are basically provided with certain kind of form work in order to cast the column. So you can see that the construction of the walls as well as the columns, they are basically simultaneously being done in uh, such kind of uh, confined kind of masonry. So uh, as a comparison, in case of uh, confined masonry, the gravity loads and lateral load resisting system, the masonry walls are the main load bearing elements and are expected to resist both gravity and lateral loads, not the vertical tie only. Confining elements are significantly smaller in size than RC beams and columns. Whereas in case of RC frame, the RC frame resists both gravity and lateral loads through their relatively large beams and columns and their connections. Masonry infills are not load bearing walls in case of RC frame. They become a major kind of load bearing element. In case of foundation construction, in case of confined masonry, the strip footing beneath the wall and there is an RC plinth band which controls the load distribution. Whereas in case of RC framed construction, you have the isolated column footing uh, beneath uh, each of the column, uh, which basically it may be connected uh, uh, with a, a plinth beam or uh, a ground beam as the case may be. In case of superstructure construction, the masonry walls are constructed first Subsequently, the tie columns are cast in place. Finally, the tie beams are constructed on top of the walls simultaneously with the floor or roof slab construction. Whereas in case of RC frame, the frame is constructed first, the masonry walls are constructed later, <coughs> which are basically not bonded to the frame members. These walls are non-structural and non-load bearing walls. So the confining elements are not designed to act as a moment resisting frame is the summary of the differences uh, between such kind of confined masonry and RC frame construction. 
and uh, as a result the detailing of the re reinforcements are much simpler in case of confined masonry uh, as to, as relative to rc frame construction uh, i will avoid uh, the various kinds of uh, adaptions that have been done but the whole summary of this uh, confined masonry has been used uh, in various countries like uh, uh, the first uh, re uh, reporting which was uh, used, uh, the use of confined masonry was done, was uh, somewhere in Italy, earthquake of magnitude 7.2, <coughs> which basically killed uh, over 70,000 people. And then this kind of confined masonry came into existence. The practice of confined masonry construction also started in Chile after 1930, uh, after the 1920 Talca earthquake, uh, which was of magnitude 8. And also in 1939, uh, earthquake uh, in uh, mid-southern regions of the country, uh, the magnitude was about 7.8. Uh, the, uh, the various uh, confined masonry buildings, uh, as reported by Morani, uh, say that uh, uh, they, they revealed a very good performance uh, when con in buildings which were basically confined. Confined masonry uh, constructed uh, in Mexico also in 1940s uh, uh, was to control the cracking in the uh, masonry due to large differential settlements under soft uh, soil conditions uh, with foundation problems. Uh, various uh, other uh, areas like in Mexico also, you can see that uh, the system, uh, this system of confined masonry became popular. Uh, due to uh, higher seismic hazards uh, in these areas, as reported by Billy Aloper. Uh, the use of confined masonry in Colombia also dates in 1930. So it is not uh, the whole uh, aspect of uh, giving you these kind of uh, studies is basically various uh, researchers have reported that uh, such kind of uh, confinement in the masonry has been utilized already uh, in 1930s and 40s. And it is uh, something which is not very new, uh, but then it is uh, not that it is being practiced uh, in our country. And uh, however, it, they have uh, all these authors say that such kind of performances uh, of such uh, confined masonry have been uh, quite satisfactory. <laughs> so over the last uh, 30 years, confined masonry construction has been practiced in Mediterranean Europe. Latin America, Middle East, South Asia, Far East uh, in China. It's also important to know that confined masonry construction is practiced in countries and regions of extremely high seismic risks. Whereas uh, we as uh, in, in, in the Indian context, except the Nepal border uh, or the North uh, Eastern regions, uh, uh, apart from that, we do not fall in a very, very high seismic risk and uh, thereby uh, uh, such kind of confined masonry and reinforced masonry also sh should uh, work extremely better uh, than um, many uh, reinforced concrete elements uh, for short uh, buildings at least, like uh, uh, at least down plus uh, three to four stories. Uh, uh, there is no problem in going with such kind of masonry is what is my feel. So basically, confined masonry constructions have typically performed well in the past earthquakes worldwide when built according to the codal requirements. Now, what are these codal requirements when it comes to such kind of hybrid construction? Its satisfactory earthquake performance is due to joint action of masonry walls and their confining elements. And uh, properly designed and built confined masonry are expected to experience damage in severe earthquakes. However, a very few cases of collapse, collapse have been reported in the past earthquakes worldwide. Conceptual considerations relating as well as the key construction issues uh, are further to be discussed. Uh, I will not dwell into this because majority of these structural engineers might have gone through. Uh, as far as architectural guidelines are concerned, it is being said that building plans should be regular, symmetrical, uh, they should be mini uh, there should be minimum irregularity. The plan aspect that is the length of the building to width of the building uh, should be ideally four and not uh, more than four. Uh, the plan layout should have effective length and height of the walls uh, being controlled with uh, by provision of pilaster, cross walls, etc. Uh, 
etcetera the vertical walls uh, should have the, that is from the floor to floor should have should be continuous one above the other so that their boundary conditions are well defined the horizontal tiles uh, uh, the position of the openings uh, should be one above the other the vertical tiles to be placed on both sides of the openings the horizontal tiles uh, ties are uh, being recommended as every floor level the vertical spacing should be less than 3 meters the vertical ties uh, i am speaking not of the columns and the uh, uh, the beams i am talking about the horizontal ties and the vertical ties uh, which are basically represented in case of confined masonry and thereby the horizontal ties uh, are uh, are to be placed at every less than 3 meters vertical ties uh, should be at a maximum spacing of 4 meters where wall to wall intersection or free end of the wall are some of the places where they need to be highlighted and uh, walls of at least two full confined walls in each directions need to be provided which means that in this uh, uh, figure you can see that at least two full confined walls one and uh, two full confined walls are basically to be uh, uh, recommended uh, and the wall density should be a minimum of 2% in each of the two orthogonal direction. This becomes a very important uh, information in the European codes in order to check whether it can, uh, uh, the building can undergo a particular kind of a, uh, acceleration. Um, and the wall height should be low to medium rise buildings. Now in order to demonstrate this wall density, uh, let us go to the Euro code 8. Uh, it, it talks about the wall density for a design ground acceleration of 0.2 g, 0.3 g and 0.4 g and the various seismic zones that have been uh, uh, mentioned that uh, uh, zone 3, zone 4 and zone 5, the wall density should be a minimum of 2% uh, in case of 0.2 g ground acceleration whereas uh, a, wall, a wall density of 4% uh, is what is recommended in case of uh, 0.3 g uh, design ground acceleration and 5 percent in case of 0.4 g uh, and the kind of building heights that are recommended in such conditions are four stories three stories and two stories in various seismic zones so this is not being just a thumb rule but it is being uh, uh, incorporated into the euro code 8 which means to say that their performances have been time tested and uh, buildings have been performing well when such kind of uh, wall density are basically being uh, adopted. Now just to uh, look at a very small problem, uh, I have taken a very, very, uh, I have solved this very small problem. Consider a two-story confined masonry building located in the seismic zone 3 of India. The walls are built of burnt clay bricks and wall thicknesses of 110. I have purposefully taken a 4-inch wall uh, just to look at how unsafe or safe it would be. Uh, the size of tie columns matches the wall size. That is the cross-sectional dimension of 110 mm by 110 mm. That is 4 inch by 4 inch. A typical floor plan is shown in this figure. That is all these ties, vertical ties are basically 4 inches by 4 inch. The thickness of this wall is basically 4 inches and whatever the lengths are have been given. So confirm that the wall density is adequate for the seismic zone 3 according to the guidelines of the Euro code 8. So I have calculated the total floor area. That is the total floor area is 9.2 into 4 into 2 stories and thereby 73.6 square meters. Wall density is defined as the wall area divided by the total floor area. If I am taking the wall area in this direction, whatever the wall area are here divided by the total floor area is what I am speaking about is what is the wall density. So in the longitudinal direction of the building, the wall area is 9.2 plus 8, which means that the complete length of this wall plus the length of this wall excluding the door uh, spacing is uh, 8 and thereby 9.2 9 plus 8 into 0 0.11 is the thickness of the wall, uh, thickness of the wall which comes to 1.9 meters square and thereby the wall density is 1.9 divided by the total floor area which comes to 0 0.026 in terms of percentage it becomes 2.6 percent now for basically a, a seismic zone 3 and uh, 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 acceleration is not being provided. A seismic zone 3, the wall density is 2% and what I have got is 2.6%. And thereby, in, in case of longitudinal direction, 
this wall density seems to be much uh, uh, better or much relatively higher than 2% per permissible value. Whereas in case of transverse direction, the wall area is 4 meters, 2.8 meters and 2.8 meters because of the existence of this window and the door. So uh, into the thickness of the, uh, multiplied by the thickness of the wall is 1.1 meter square and thereby the wall density is 1.1 divided by 73.6 which is 1.5 percent which is less than 2 percent. And hence, in case of the lateral stability of the walls, uh, I need to increase the wall thickness from half brick thick to one brick thick in transverse direction because of the lower value for uh, the zone 3 and thereby when I try to increase this wall thickness to double as the wall density is directly proportional to the wall thickness, wall density also will get doubled and thereby this value automatically will go to one uh, instead of 1.5 it will go to 3 percent when I increase this wall thickness 2.23 or whatever 9 inches wall thickness if I go. So it is recommended I can provide this as 4 inch walls however these walls can uh, need to be structurally safer only when I try to provide it to 9 inches or 23 uh, centimeters. So that is a simple example of how wall density can give me a, a, a quick uh, kind of a uh, stability uh, criteria for the building. Now the various other kind of uh, guidelines are uh, as per the codal provisions are um, is my time what is the time it is uh, 141 it is 241 uh, another 10 minutes is what uh, i will try to find out so basically the construction guidelines uh, are i need to get into a good workmanship quality of building material which i have already talked about the vertical ties uh, are being recommended by the different codes in different countries generally longitudinal reinforcement should be 410 mm so it is not basically a design of the vertical tie but in case of uh, such kind of elements, it is 4 of 10 mm diameter, lateral reinforcement of 6 mm at uh, 8 inches spacing uh, center to center and lapping of vertical bars uh, at least of uh, half a meter needs to be uh, taken care of. The minimum cross-sectional area of the vertical ties should be at least uh, 4 inches by 4 inches or 100 mm by 100 mm is what is basically recommended. A plinth band of uh, RC, uh, is to be provided at the plinth level is what is being recommended. Foundations uh, also have been, recommendations have been given for foundations, wall constructions, the way it is to be constructed. Uh, like I would say that there is a wall here, there is a wall here, a, a face is being given in order to uh, cast the concrete uh, in between the two wallings and maybe a cross wall would also be uh, erupting from this area. Yeah, and thereby that is the kind of uh, vertical tie that uh, the codes speak about. So avoiding this, I will uh, go to uh, finally the various building codes that have been given by uh, the countries of Chile, Mexico, Euro Code 8, Iran, the code of Iran. Uh, for uh, tie columns and for tie beams, there are various kinds of uh, recommendations that have been given as to uh, uh, what have been the kind of cross-sectional dimensions to be adopted for vertical ties and what should be the kind of uh, reinforcements that needs to be adopted and the transverse reinforcements to be adopted. So with minor variations, uh, I say that majority of the portal provisions of these countries uh, do speak the same. The width uh, uh, is about 150 to 200 mm, whereas the longitudinal reinforcement is 410 mm deformed bar and the transverse reinforcement is 6 mm at 8 inches center to center. On the contrary, you can also see that uh, uh, the Euro code 8 also speaks about the same kind of uh, reinforcement. Similarly, the tie beams also have been defined as to how much should they be for different kinds of uh, uh, mason, in, in, in masonry confined constructions. Uh, so you as this as this this table as the summary of whatever I want I have covered in the past. So for Chile, for Mexico, Euro code and Iran, the references have been given as to what kind of codes have been referred to in order to summarize this table. Now, 
uh, coming to the last couple of slides, the various new trends uh, that have been uh, that are being worked on are uh, some studies on containment reinforcement in masonry is being conducted in IIC Bangalore and uh, IIT Kanpur uh, by Dr. Durgesh Rai and uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, studies that are being uh, highlighted uh, are something which are explorable in smaller institute like ours too. The studies on containment reinforcement uh, shows the performance of the reinforced masonry under seismic loads. Earlier, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, professors like Arya in IIT Roorkee had suggested reinforcement uh, at the junctions of the masonry, uh, where the reinforcement were to be provided at the center of the walls. However, as the uh, um, uh, earthquakes uh, shaking occurs, um, uh, the bending of the element do take place uh, as uh, out of plane uh, bending of, into the walls. The reinforcements uh, are relatively better performing when they are provided at the external faces of the masonry rather than the reinforcement being provided at the uh, center of the walls all along within the wall. So, so rather than uh, that, such kind of reinforcement as shown in the figure, the performance of reinforced masonry under seismic loads have been uh, not only uh, taking care of the bending of these uh, out of plane bending of the uh, masonry element, uh, they also induce certain kind of ductility uh, in the masonry is what is uh, also being observed. So experiments on dynamic tests on reinforced masonry and energy absorption capabilities can be easily tested in uh, most of our colleges also. You do not require uh, very high-end uh, equipments like accelerograms, uh, etc. in order to uh, uh, record the kind of vibrations but then an impact load uh, a shock load uh, and the kind of absorption of energy can also be a, a relative performance as to how such kind of elements uh, behave uh, under lateral loading and impact loading and one of the uh, experimental setup that um, uh, I'm going to show you as my last slide is uh, where uh, there are various models that you can see that uh, this is uh, the shock table in the plan you can see that there is a, a I don't call this as a shake table but this is a shock table basically because uh, the vibrations are not in use it is the shock that an impact load that is basically given at the base of this diaphragm and uh, the kind of uh, vibrate uh, the impact shocks basically uh, are transferred from this base to the building model now various building models can be tested like here you can see this is a building model uh, to one third scale on a strong base where the shock is being given here and not to the building and all the vibrations go to the building uh, or model and uh, you can see with openings and without openings can be tested and with a lintel band and a roof band with or without a diaphragm uh, plate or as a RC roof. Uh, you can test uh, various kinds of impact load as to how much the building can sustain. On the contrary, uh, you can also see that uh, this uh, model consisted of a lintel band as well as a sill band a, 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 and they were reinforced uh, vertically also. You can see small lines here which means that GI wires were basically being provided uh, vertically and uh, thereby this is the basic uh, containment model where reinforcement were being provided at these lines. You can see this slight vertical line where reinforcement as I showed in the earlier figure, uh, such kind of a model was basically created and uh, a, a building without the vertical reinforcement and only the horizontal uh, lintel band and a model with uh, bands at the sill level and uh, or uh, lintel level with vertical reinforcements were tested simultaneously. Now you can see when uh, impact loads of 15, 20 shocks were basically given by a strong uh, solid uh, steel mass, which was basically left from a particular distance and like a pendulum and the shock was basically given to the base and uh, uh, the number of shocks that uh, the building model could undergo is uh, was uh, converted into energy input. So an unreinforced model uh, 
the amount of energy that was estimated was about 135 Newton meter. And, and uh, you could see there was a complete collapse of the unreinforced kind of uh, model, which uh, is not there in the figure. But the model with horizontal bands here, the, uh, the lintel band that was given, you could see the energy input uh, at collapse. There was a partial collapse, uh, where, whereas unreinforced element collapsed completely. Uh, however, the amount of energy that uh, was absorbed by this model was about 671, which was about five times larger than the unreinforced uh, model. Whereas the model with horizontal bands, uh, which had containment reinforcement also, the energy inputs were uh, absorption at the final uh, 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 number of shocks were about 1967 uh, Newton meter, which was about uh, maybe about 19 or 20 times more than an unreinforced model and uh, about three, three to four times more than the models only with horizontal bands. And you could see that uh, the building, uh, the model did not collapse. As you can see, this is a tested model. You can see huge amounts of small cracks all over the uh, various joints. However, the model did not collapse like in other cases. No, there was no collapse, but with number of cracks that was that was basically displayed. So such kind of simple experimentations can uh, raise the confidence of uh, not only uh, the engineering community, but uh, uh, in order to convince the clients in the semi-urban and rural areas, such kind of model tests can also be carried out in order to convince that structural masonry is also a masonry component and uh, structural uh, load bearing structures can also behave uh, appropriately during earthquakes provided appropriate uh, uh, requirements for its stability in terms of containment reinforcement and various bands are being taken uh, uh, care of during the construction phase so with that uh, i would uh, like to end my uh, talk uh, at this point of time although i had the promised uh, dr sony that i would take only one and a half hours but i have almost consumed uh, two hours i hope uh, there was no break as i have not got any call from any of the organizers and hopefully uh, although it is out of context of the total um, topic of the um, program i hope uh, you have enjoyed uh, the uh, talk uh, in terms of some new information and some of the studies that uh, we all together can undertake uh, in the various in and around colleges. With that, thank you and over to uh, Dr. Sodhi. Uh, thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, it was a nice presentation and uh, kind of ignored area with respect to analysis and design, I can say, the masonry. We generally don't focus on while uh, going for the design with respect to seismic analysis and all. Yeah. All right. So, so we are having few questions uh, from the participants. Sure. Uh, uh, so, first one is, uh, how effectively we use brick masonry in lateral load resistant building when uh, if you focus on seismic loading. Yeah, that is what I say in the, in the current uh, practices that we basically see. Although uh, a lot of people do uh, in frame uh, analysis uh, uh, as to how much walls act as shear walls, etc. But as far as uh, the current uh, reinforced concrete buildings that you observe, I don't see any connection between the wallings and the columns. And thereby, uh, the the question of uh, how effectively these walls behave as shear walls uh, is something which becomes a question, one. And the other thing is, uh, when we try to look at uh, the uh, boundary conditions and the characteristics of the, um, uh, of the, uh, the, the properties of the uh, materials that we give, so we have already now seen in the presentation that the uh, elastic modulus and uh, compressive strength kind of uh, figures are very, very low in our Indian conditions. And thereby, how effectively uh, these uh, behave as are effective in resisting the lateral loads is a big question which needs to be uh, inspected uh, with the 
current figures that we have got in the Indian literature. Right. Did I answer uh, the question? I do not know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the next one is uh, how is uh, tension in bricks? Right. That's a very nice uh, question, which we generally do not uh, apply our mechanics to such kind of uh, elements. Uh, basically, this splitting tension in the brick occurs basically because uh, the elastic modulus of the mortar is, let us say, in the Indian condition, it is very high. It is very, very uh, or relatively lower, maybe about five to nine times lower than that of the mortar that we use. So when loading is, uh, as I showed you in the figure, when a loading, uh, vertical loading is given to a kind of a uh, sandwiched brick between the uh, mortar and the brick, in that case, what happens? The lateral deformations try to occur because of the axial form in both the direction. The mortar will also try to deform in both the direction. But presuming that the masonry is acting as a composite element, which means that our, uh, technically speaking, kaolinetic soils are uh, to be adopted, which means that black cotton soils cannot be used for uh, such making of such mortars. So it is basically uh, red kaolinitic soils, which are non-expansive. So kaolinite, bentonite, all these kind of soils can be utilized. Uh, the only uh, simple property is high shrinkage and swelling of the soils need to be avoided. Majority of the red soils fall in this category of kaolinitic soils and can be utilized to certain extent uh, in, in, as a combination mortar where the elastic modulus comes down and tries to match with that of the brick. However, uh, addition of some amount of lime or some amount of soil uh, may or may not probably reduce the compressive strength as compared to one of one is to six conventional cement mortar, which means to say that by using combination mortars, I am trying to, uh, I'm trying to make the uh, mortar more uh, softer uh, and thereby match the uh, softness of the brick that I am using in the masonry. And that's how uh, it becomes more uh, advantageous of either using some amounts of lime and uh, lime or soil. Did I answer that, sir? No, yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Right, right. Okay. Uh, one more question, sir. Uh, is the conventional brick masonry resist the lateral load? Parallel or perpendicular to the line of action of lateral load. An unreinforced brick masonry will be relatively very poor in resisting lateral loads. Right? Uh, in order to see that the out of plane bending of the masonry walls are to be resisted properly, I need to go in for this uh, containment reinforcement, which means that the reinforcements are to be provided at the surface of the walls and both the reinforcement provided at the surface of the walls are to be interconnected. So which means to say that I need to provide this reinforcement during the construction of the masonry itself and thereby during the uh, after every two or three courses, the two reinforcement on both the sides are to be in interconnected with a hook or a, uh, or a single stirrup, uh, which can uh, keep the two reinforcements intact even during a lateral loading and thereby uh, the the integrity of the reinforcement with the wall uh, during the construction matters a lot in improving the lateral resistance of the uh, wall itself okay uh, the next one sir can we effectively use masonry in the structure as a structural member Yes, definitely. All these uh, two hours that I basically gave uh, yeah. is to convince that uh, masonry elements also are uh, appropriate structural members. They can be designed appropriately for vertical loads as well as lateral loads. And uh, thereby, a lot more studies also needs to be undertaken by structural students in order to incorporate masonry as structural elements. It, it, it's definitely that uh, uh, reinforced masonry can uh, act appropriately as structural elements. Yeah. 
uh one more question sir how the yeah. masonry compound wall is laterally protected in case of uh, load with respect to black cotton soil and when the length uh, is lateral loads uh, see black cotton soil is something which is uh, inducing you an uplift pressure uh, mm -hmm. i don't think uh, lateral loads are being caused due to the movements in the foundation uh, maybe i do not know what, what uh, is the question there on the chat yeah yeah can you read the question uh, uh, once more how the masonry compound wall is laterally protected uh, in case of lateral load means with respect to lateral loads yeah uh, in case of black cotton soil having larger length larger length uh, larger. Uh, i would i, I think would, so. I would, no, I would, I, think I, would, uh, at, I would look at this question in two different uh, uh, contexts. There, uh, I, I do not know why does the uh, person who is questioning uh, feeling that there would be lateral loads due to black cotton soil. Black cotton soil is in case if there is a movement, it would either give an uplift pressure or when it contracts, it would basically undergo uh, downward bending. That is one. But however, there would be a possibility that the compound walls, which are freestanding, they are only basically bound at the base, uh, at the plinth level. I do not know even there is an appropriate bound, uh, 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 binding between the plinth beam uh, or the ground beam to that of the compound wall. However, at the top, there is no constraint and thereby they are freestanding or they are almost like cantilever walls. Now, any kind of lateral load like uh, a buffalo uh, rubbing its body on the wall or a truck coming and a vehicle coming and hitting the compound wall would be a lateral load or a shaking at the ground level would be a lateral load. So compound walls are can be subjected to lateral. The best way of uh, looking at the resistance to compound walls uh, I am not talking about earthquakes. Earthquakes, I am not bothered whether the uh, compound walls uh, behave properly or not. I am bothered more about my uh, building masonry rather than the compound walls. So even if the compound walls damage, I do not mind. But then very large compound walls can be strengthened by providing cross walls or pilasters, small cross sections. Although my compound wall is four inches at every eight feet, or every seven feet, I can provide a nine inch by nine inch bound column made of brick itself, not reinforced concrete column. But my cross section of the masonry can be increased at every interval of uh, six to eight uh, feet, and uh, which act as uh, pilasters or uh, cross uh, pillars uh, for the thin wall that I have constructed as a compound wall. So that is one of the best ways. Otherwise, if the walls are taller, in such cases, I can go for um, uh, basically a cantilever uh, uh, retaining kind of walls, which are perpendicular to the plane of the wall. Uh, as we can see, one of the classical examples are the uh, tall walls of the churches in Goa, which are basically uh, strengthened by uh, the cross pillar pillars or pilasters that you can see are architectural features, which are elements which they are basically uh, reducing the slenderness of the tall walls constructed in the churches. So cross pillars, pilasters are the best way of uh, providing uh, uh, stability to the compound walls. These pilasters can also become uh, can be made reinforced in order to further increase their resistance. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, uh, there are a few questions uh, for the confined masonry now, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, what are the limitations of confined masonry? Why it is not used frequently in India? Uh, it is uh, uh, one of the pertinent uh, answers is it is ignorance. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, uh, why is that after so much of couple of decades of education that stirrups are to be bent by 135 degrees? Do we still do it? Even larger companies like LNT and uh, etc. If you go and see to the columns, the stirrups are 90 degree bent only. Why is that? It is being done like that. It is ignorance and incompetency of the engineering supervision that is being done on the site. So uh, there are two things. 
uh, I would answer this question. We as uh, up upcoming engineers, we need to look at uh, the kind of learnings that we do, how fundamentally we do it, with what kind of confidence that we execute it on the site. We generally, once after graduation, we go and become again a student on the site as to what the mason is doing. We accept that and thereby we do not, uh, this is basically because of a lack of confidence of telling what is to be done on the site. Uh, the mason says, the, the bar vendor says that last 20 years I have been doing like this and irrespective of how many number of times you tell, the stirrups are bent by 90 degrees only. They never get uh, bent much more beyond that as uh, being explored in earthquake engineering uh, now since past uh, couple of decades. So why is this being done? It is ignorance and a lack of uh, uh, application of the engineering that we have learned in our uh, days. We do not go and execute that on the site is basically where we lack confidence into it. So why is it, uh, why confined masonry is not being used? Uh, it is basically used. All the wadas, all the earlier uh, day buildings uh, yeah. basically had these uh, wooden columns in between. Yeah. Uh, all the walls had fibers and uh, uh, biological or uh, uh, these uh, biodegradable nets inside it. So basically all these uh, uh, are techniques uh, although not with modern materials, but with older uh, kind of materials locally available that were being explored with their own uh, technological innovations. But however, with uh, the equations of motion, the pendulum, the, uh, the, the uh, sinusoidal wave that we have gone into mathematics today, uh, we have forgotten these very fundamental uh, applications that uh, would uh, enhance the behavior of the uh, buildings uh, in and around, especially the smaller buildings that we generally construct day to day. So these can need to be applied and thereby how fundamentally we go out as engineers matters a lot. All right. All right, sir. Uh, uh, next one is, uh, which code is to be used to design the building using confined masonry? Uh, there is no uh, appropriate kind of a code, I would say like uh, IS-456 for reinforced concrete elements, uh, there is no uh, basic uh, code uh, to see that uh, a wall is appropriately designed in this way only, right? Uh, I don't see any Indian codal uh, provision uh, being uh, recommended yet. But there are various kinds of codes for masonry as a non-engineered structure, right? But then, the guidelines for earthquake resistant non-engineered construction is a, a nice compendium to be referred to for the design of uh, uh, masonry structures. Uh, you will not get any equations of motions in order to um, look at and the kind of analysis to be done in order to show whether it is safe or not. Basically because of the reason I, I, I uh, said somewhere in between that I cannot analyze masonry because of its inisotropic kind of behavior of the building unit itself, right? And it becomes very, very complex uh, because the failure you can see could be basically because of very, very, very weak brick uh, being used at certain places in the buildings. So as far as uh, the performance of the masonry buildings are concerned, I need to be very careful about the uh, building raw materials that I use uh, right in the beginning, uh, which would uh, take a long way uh, to uh, speak about the stability of the building. Yeah, uh, so I would like to take the next question now. Yeah. Uh, how to design tides in confined masonry building? How to design? Design, mm -hmm. uh, see, as I said, this is a hybrid construction and uh, the codal provisions have directly been given saying that the spacing of the stirrups can be at uh, 4 inches uh, or uh, 150 mm by different kinds of countries that have been adopted. Uh, even when we try to design our reinforced concrete columns, uh, there is no specific kind of reinforcement uh, uh, spacing 
that we come across except the three uh, uh, three rules whether the rod is 16 times the diameter of the rod or uh, 10 times the diameter of uh, the least lateral dimension so such kind of conditions whichever is least is what we recommend as the stirrup spacing isn't it yeah. even in the reinforced concrete column uh, how is the reinforcement uh, of the, uh, the lateral tie being spaced? It is basically the three criteria of which whichever is the least is what we adopt. Yeah. Right. So similarly here, the least uh, is somewhere about uh, the, the, the minimum uh, distance that has been given by various codes is about 100 mm. But then the amount of reinforcement that has been recommended is only 6 6 mm diameter mild steel is what is basically uh, recommended by the various codes. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, uh, last two questions now, sir. Yeah. Uh, last but one is, uh, can thickness of horizontal band and vertical ties be greater than the thickness of the wall? Uh, no. Uh, it can be there, but then the integrity uh, of the confined masonry that has been recommended by the various codes say that the wall thickness and uh, the thickness are almost the same. So uh, based on the kind of analysis I showed that for various uh, zones and for various ground acceleration, the amount of wall density to be adopted uh, will give you the thickness of the wall. So naturally, once the thickness of the wall is 9 inches, it is better that I go for a, uh, a ring beam of 9 inches width only. Why is that I would like to go for uh, uh, larger than 9 inch thickness? Neither I will go for lesser than 9 inch thickness because it would be too odd that the, if I go for a 4 inch uh, little band, the 4 inch needs to be filled up with brick again. So instead of that, it is better that I go for uh, the little band which is equal of that of the wall thickness itself. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, the last question now, sir. Yeah. Uh, can we manufacture masonry itself as a damper in structural system? Uh, precast panels have been utilized, but then uh, as this in, in very large span building, yes. Probably even I would recommend the pre-stressed kind of elements being introduced uh, into the frames. However, uh, generally pre-stressing is uh, generally is adopted when the spans becomes very, very large. So in case of buildings where the uh, column sizes have uh, a spacing of uh, four to five meters, I don't consider um, any kind of pre-stressing uh, uh, as an appropriate kind of technique. Uh, but uh, as you say, that uh, precast elements can be utilized, uh, but how they are going to be bound together again is something uh, where their uh, structural integrity would be in question. So basically, the connectivity of these larger precast elements need to be ensured on the site. Yeah, right. Okay, uh, so I think uh, that's all from the question answer session. Yeah. So I would now officially thank uh, Dr. Gumaste for enlightening us with such a nice presentation. Uh, I think definitely this will trigger uh, at least the thought in the mind of participants that we should focus on the masonry also while yes. going for the analysis and design of the structures. So, uh, on behalf of the uh, Department of Civil Engineering, uh, I would like to thank our speaker and as well as uh, the participants for uh, attending this particular session. So, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, now, now, for the participants, uh, tomorrow morning, we are going to begin our session uh, exactly at 10 o'clock. And uh, the session will be based on, again, SAP 2000. Uh, Dr. Patil is going to conduct the session. So be on time. The link will be shared on the Telegram group. And uh, today's attendance uh, sheet is shared already on the chat window. And the feedback form is also shared on the Telegram group. Uh, so be there.
on time tomorrow so see you tomorrow till then goodbye everyone